Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted to be joined today by Deborah and Antonio, but more importantly, our guest, Paul Stevenson. Paul, you may recognize from the BBC TV series, Employable Me. Paul is a Tourette's advocate and Tourette's is uh, a, a syndrome that is little understood. And um, I think it's really well past time that we, we talked about this subject. So I'm delighted to have Paul with us. So Paul, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, yeah, my, my name's Paul. I'm, I'm 56 years old now. Uh, I, <clears throat> my condition basically came out of nowhere 10 years ago after suffering from post-traumatic stress. Uh, although Tourette's syndrome is a lifelong condition, it's a genetic condition and you're born with it. Mine <clears throat> got pretty mild until uh, I suffered some trauma and was unable to control the condition. So, uh, pretty much tipped my life upside down. Uh, and since starting with Tourette syndrome, uh, I got offered a hand of help myself in order to come to terms with it. And it, like you said before, it's very, very misunderstood. And I've made it my goal to spread awareness and help others, especially younger people coming out of education into employment, uh, to embrace the condition and live along with it. So. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, um, I, I've, I'd seen the TV series and, and, and actually my the first time I saw um, a, a documentary about Tourette's, I, I mean, I knew a bit about it beforehand, but, but at, at, was um, Tourette's I Swear I Can't Help It, which was a few years ago. Um, and, and, and that was an amazing documentary. Um, but at the same time, people think it's humorous, but the, the consequences of some of the stuff that happens is, is you know, significant. Yeah, you, you, were, you were tweeting not long ago about um, it's a good job you being quite a burly guy because you had a tendency to walk into public toilets and not be able to control what you said. <laughs> yeah, uh, just shout, shouting random things out, which <laughs> obviously, you know, uh, I always say that my <clears throat> the most my, my vocal tics end up being the most inappropriate thing that you're in the store, you know, you get racist tics, you get uh, <clears throat> tics insulting people who are in authority, uh, uh, blurs against people, your friends, different things, and it's <clears throat> not really got any control over what's going to come out. Uh, and <clears throat> but saying that, People like myself who have this condition, Papalalia, are a very small percentage of the average Tourette's person who lives with Tourette's syndrome. Uh, they, they reckon five to ten percent, but myself and a few other people around the world think there's a, a quite a few more. Uh, so I don't represent the Tourette's community as my Tourette's manifests itself, but I find myself in a pretty unique position as an adult. <laughs> living with a condition that a lot of children and young adults have, where I can articulate to parents, to employers, to teachers, to social workers, <coughs> but maybe the younger person can't. And also, it gives me a connection with younger people, uh, because one of the biggest things, one of the biggest journeys I've made is Tourette's syndrome. Uh, you get your diagnosis and the doctor goes, Congratulations, you've got Tourette's syndrome, there's the door. And it's like, well, what do I do next? And there's so many things. I mean, you can't, there's, there's that feeling of not being able to believe why these things or understand why these things are coming out. So the journey is about embracing the condition and getting to understand everything about it in order to carry on and live with Tourette's syndrome. Hey! Oh, well, always. Yeah, and, and and I I guess the, the there's a couple of elements that that you know there's the element of making sure that people have the support they need when they get their their diagnosis, and then there's also the element of making sure that the people around them understand what's 
going on and, and can support them and don't take it to heart when you know ticks come in and you accidentally whack someone or or offend someone that's that's the most important that is better than any prescription because there's no specific medication for experience and there's no cure so we the dilemma we've got what do we do do we stay indoors do we hide away and as far as i'm concerned is that if somebody came into a, a workspace in a wheelchair and their, their disability confined them to a wheelchair, people might turn around and notice somebody coming in and think, oh, that person's disabled. Now, I want people to have that attitude with Tourette's syndrome, that when someone walks into a room with Tourette's syndrome and what creates a disturbance or makes a noise, people just think, oh, and not pay any more attention than that, you know, other than, hi, how are you doing? Let's get on with things. And I think that it's going for that acceptance. And I don't think we've quite got that acceptance yet with Tourette's syndrome in society. And, and that's due to the inappropriateness of it and also the stigma attached to it that everybody thinks it's a comedic condition and, <clears throat> and that everybody swears with, with Tourette's. So there's two things there. There's, there's <clears throat> acceptance and hey, changing the stigma. Hey. You, you, it's funny, Paul. First of all, thank you for being on the program. We really, really appreciate your work because we really focus on, you know, t just accepting who we each are as human beings. And so I, I was thinking, too, that we think it's so funny that everybody with Tourette's syndrome all of a sudden starts cussing and cursing. And, and we've made it such a joke that we've made the stigma worse. And I, I, and I know off air you were talking about just some of the misunderstandings in your life that people have, you know, you know, you're, um, you're going through adoption and stuff like that. And people, they think they, it, there's so much misinformation specifically about Tourette's. It's, it's just amazing. You know, that it's, it's a joke and it's not a joke. It's, you know, it, it, and so the, I, I'm, I think your work is so important. And, um, you know, what are some of the things that you're suggesting that others with Tourette's, and I love that you're working with, with young people too, because they need to, they want to, it seems like they're doing an even better job of understanding and accepting us each as being individuals. And do you have quirks? I don't know. Why are they quirks? It's just who you are. It's, you know, you're made up of a million different pieces, and that's just one piece. So I'm just... I'm curious what you recommend to the younger people that are trying to deal with this. How do we change society's minds about, you know, well, Tourette's and neurodiversity? I could give you an example. At one of the meetings, I, a young person came to me. Because uh, we've got support groups around the, the UK. Uh, I go into schools and, like I said, I go into universities. But at one of these support group meetings, a, a young person came up to me and said that I'm not getting any help at college. So I think I'm going to change college. Do you think I should change college? So I asked the questions, uh, how long have you got at college? Do you have a lot of friends at college? Yes, I've got six months left. Uh, I said, what help do you need? And the young person said, not 100% sure. So I said, do you fully understand how your condition manifests itself? You know, uh, and it's only until you understand how Tourette's and yourself work. Now, Tourette, when you get a diagnosis of Tourette's syndrome, it's not usually a standalone diagnosis. It usually comes along with ADHD, OCD, and other spectrum disorders. So you've got, you've met one person with Tourette's syndrome, you've met one person with Tourette's syndrome. And also in that mix, is your personality uh, because my personality is so entwined in my condition and it's we're pretty much unique like a fingerprint uh, so one thing that I do suggest to young people is go on that journey go on that voyage of understanding getting to know yourself again and how you are with Tourette's syndrome that makes sense it does it does make sense I don't know enough about Tourette's syndrome, but I'm going to assume, like anything else that we're dealing with the brain, when you get in more stressful situations, 
it probably gets a little worse. I, I, I would just assume that. I don't know that for sure. <laughs> so in a time when you're trying to control it, right? Go ahead. Well, this, no, it, it is. It's, it, you're correct. It, stress and anxiety exacerbates the condition. So is I when I'm talking to people on how do we work along with someone who's got Tourette syndrome, what I try and do is build up an appreciation for the individual with Tourette syndrome that their work day or their school day doesn't start at nine o'clock or eight o'clock on Monday morning. That day starts the night before. Preempting what things are going to befall you. Uh, <clears throat> am I going to be in a situation where my tics are going to bother people? Uh, so the anxiety is building up all the time. Am I going to concentrate on doing my work all day when I'm holding my tics in? So we find a lot of people with Tourette syndrome in a public scenario, in a working scenario in school, suppress and hold the tics in. Now this takes extreme amount of concentration, willpower. So if you think about it, at school, we've got people with Tourette's who are like middle level attainment, but yet the reason why they're at that middle level is because they're holding and suppressing and dealing with all this neurological stuff that's going on. Uh, so if we can relieve any of that stress and pressure, that's, this is the thing is what, once they get to understand the condition and they can explain things to people, uh, then the, the next step is getting other people to understand and what can we do to make your day easier so you can cope and you can be productive and get along with things. And uh, it's, you know, <clears throat> for, for a very complex neurological condition, there's some very fundamental things that we can put in place to, to deal with that. Hey, I'll use it for example, my own, because I, I, I was born in the 60s. I had, I had ADHD, OCD, sensory processing, and Tourette's. Now, I didn't know I had the conditions. I think we had what we call back then naughty boy syndrome. That's what people, you know, that's all I was, a naughty child. But I, was, I had quite a high attainment level at school. Uh, and my school reports, my mum's still got them. It reads back, Paul has got quite a, Paul, Paul has got a very high attainment level, but do not be misled by this level because he does nothing but disrupt, distract and interfere with other children and does not pay attention and daydreams. So now if you see a kid Terrible. nowadays <laughs> yeah, who's hitting high attainment levels but yet basically <laughs> not with you in the classroom, you think, hmm, there's going on here, but mm. back then oh, all the kind of stuff going on. Hey. You know what it will also make me, <clears throat> and I don't want to hog the mi microphone. So Antonio and Neil, you know, I'll say one more thing. But I would wonder how 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 can um, people that love you and love somebody with Tourette's how how do we do a better job of supporting what you, the individual is going through with Tourette's? They're, they're you know because. Like anything else, I think sometimes if we are surrounded by people that understand us and can help advocate with us and for us, that it makes things easier. But it would seem that, you know, the loved ones are going to be confused by this very complicated diagnosis, as you mentioned as well. People who make assumptions based on what the perceptions are, what they see. So uh, my parents are very religious. When the condition came out in me, they thought, based on the religious faith, that I might have had been possessed, and they did a lot of praying. And and you know, I understand that, and I'm I'm grateful that they took that viewpoint. But they once they got to know the condition, their perception changed to the point of realizing that this this is a neurological condition. Paul has no control over, and there's a grieving process goes on because people are thinking. You want, you want the best for your kids, you want your best for the future, and yet your child seems to have been taken over by this condition that moves you about and as you're saying things. But I'm still here, I'm still Paul, I'm still a son, I'm still a husband, a dad. And it's about our loved ones, how they view us. You know, they, they don't see a clown, they don't see someone who's cracking jokes all the time, they just see someone who's got. Uh, I did something with a rehabilitation centre in Newcastle 
and they used to bring student nurses to my house. And the doctor who used to come, he said, I'm going to ask you a question now. Tell me your opinion of Paul. And nearly every one of them said, he's somebody who hasn't got very much control. So after an hour of being at my house, he asked them the, the same question again. He said, he's got someone who's got unbelievable amounts of control. <laughs> uh, you know, because, the, and that's it, just a very short period of time, perception changed, person goes off into the, doing whatever career they are, spreading that same message around. So it's keeping that positive message going on about, about talking. Paul, do you, um, in, in relation to uh, young, young children and support for parents, so when young kids need to start interacting with others, could be at the crash, could be at uh, early days in school, do you know any work being developed to support parents and to help kids? Because, uh, you know, it could be, uh, they can be in a difficult situation, kids sometimes, uh, the way how they understand others' behavior can also be extremely complicated. Do you know any cases where parents can have support? How, uh, or how can they manage and learn more about the condition of their kids in order, in order to help them and also to help the community that they are part of? Right, well, there, there's a lot of research going on with the threat societies. But I think that, you, you know, when you go to your consultant, your doctor, he can, he can write your prescription for medication. The best prescription that you can be given is to be encouraged to build up a good support network around you. And that's for parents to get involved in support groups. And they're getting, like, they're getting advice off other parents who, whose children have Tourette's, off adults. Uh, because myself as an adult, I'm a, it's an untapped resource of information that I can you know, give to parents. And I think that <clears throat> when, we, when we run support group meetings, families come along, they meet other families, and they've got so much, even though Tourette's is like pretty individual, like I said, this, they're getting life skills uh, off other parents, like, well, how do you deal with a tick attack? How do, you, how do you deal when it's nighttime and your son can't get to sleep because he's ticking? And parents go, well, actually, I found out that this works. So one of the best things is is to to be involved with the support group network, and <clears throat> there are uh, therapies out like uh, cognitive behavioural therapies, and they seem to have a lot of success when on early diagnosis, early intervention. Uh, pretty good. Like someone like myself, <clears throat> I'm a bit long in the tooth, you know. It's been it's been with me so long that it's become so entwined in my personality. Hey. I, I, I struggle to wonder where the condition starts and where, hey, where does Paul stop? Bop, 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 bop. Hey. So I don't know, did I answer your question there, Antonio? Hey. Oh. No, uh, what, uh, yeah, yes, the, what, what I wanted was basically to talk about that and see how people can at least have some points uh, when they are listening to the conversation that, that, that they can follow because not just in this condition, in other conditions, parents sometimes are always uh, a bit lost about what they should do. Yeah. And as we are able to understand uh, since the days that we started Access Chat, there are some neurological conditions that are not very well understood even by the uh, by doctors. So. Uh, and sometimes parents struggle in that initial process. I think uh, the point you're making, and also I'd like to add to that point, is that this isn't a rare condition. Uh, we're talking maybe one in 100 school children or people will be affected by it. But one of the negative things about the condition is that you feel so alone, you feel isolated. I, I've, I've run two timelines on Twitter. Uh, and anything that comes up about Tourette's, a lot of negative things and bad things, and, and it has, but also there's some people come on and they need help. And I, I, we haven't mentioned in areas, but there's somebody from another country said to me that the son were having trouble at school. We feel so alone. We're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I engaged, and I just asked them where they were, 
and I contacted a friend in the same country, but thousands of miles away, and they were able to help me put them in touch with a Tourette's chapter that was maybe four minutes away from where they lived. So one of the other good points to know is that you are not alone uh, with this condition. There's, there's lots and lots of us out there. So I'd like that to go across to people, really. So, Paul, that's, um, it's, it's great to know that, that, that there are people out there and there are sort of networks to help. Um, are they well publicized or is that something that, that, that still needs work? No, the, the well publicized, I think one of the main things, one thing that I'd like to see being done now uh, is that on, it's about early diagnosis, early intervention. We've got this, we've had this sort of society about putting negative labels on children. Now, getting a diagnosis for a neurological condition you have isn't a negative label. It's something that leads to understanding and also leads to support. So what I'd like to see is that in all our consultants where we deal with neurology is that, well, for instance, if we go to uh, an electrical store and buy any product, with that product comes a, a guidebook on how do we operate this product. Now, what I'd like to see is that when you get diagnosed, you get given one of these guidebooks on what do I do next? And in these guidebooks on what do I do next is, if you live in this country, get in touch with Tourette's Action in America, in a Canada, Tourette's Canada. Do you know, this is the phone number. What helps, what will help, rather than saying, whack all this medication in you, which sometimes medication is necessary, but the most important thing is, is contact with other people who live with it. So maybe localised support groups, because the, the network I've, I've got, the friends that I've got, the friends that I've made is, is worldwide. Uh, you know, like I said, in another country, within a matter of seconds, I were able to put somebody on to somebody else, signpost network, who could help them. So I'd like to see that from day one when you get your diagnosis, that you walk away with, you know, rather than just being shown the front door, well, the, the exit away with a an instruction pamphlet on oh, 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 oh. Uh, but yeah, there's like I said, you're not alone, and there's a lot. You know, there's a lot of support groups, and the fantastic support groups. Well, hey, they can send me a Christmas card now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Paul, I have another question. Uh, uh, to, uh, what do you do? What do you do as a career? Do you um, support people with Tourette's as a consultant? I, um, I'm right. just uh, curious. I, <clears throat> I, right. At the, at the moment, there's no funding for going into schools. Okay. Uh, schools don't have a budget for this education. Teachers aren't taught. They're, they're taught how to teach. They're not taught right. to be consultants, doctors, nurses. They're, they're taught how to, to put information across to our children the best way I can. So basically, it's a mission impossible task that we've got. Unless there's an introduction into certain neurological conditions, the first time they're going to come across it is when they have a child in the class. And right. this is why sparks fly, things don't work out. So since starting with a condition, I've, I've made it my goal uh, looking for sponsorship to fund it but I haven't yet found sponsorship so I, I go into schools uh, I've not been able to secure uh, a long-term employment uh, because my condition well what thing is about Tourette syndrome the most predictable thing about it is that it's unpredictable so yesterday I was having a tick seizure for 20 minutes on the floor I tweeted about wow. it <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> I, I couldn't move. Uh, wow. wow. And I dislocate my shoulders. I dislocate my knees. Mm -hmm. Now, so people, it's not a, I don't want people to feel sorry for me or anything like that, but it's just, it's not just about, well, it's not just about <clears throat> inappropriate stuff to us. It's not just about people making noises. Uh, there's a lot of secondary disability that comes along with it. Where you wouldn't think that a neurological condition could give you severe hey, uh, orthopedic issues. So I'm waiting for my left knee to be replaced because 
my tits make me drop to the floor and my, my knees mm -hmm. absolutely shot out. So, um, but I'm still part of society and I've worked, being 14, I've always had two jobs and one of the biggest things to come to, uh, and I know this is a sensitive subject, uh, is climate, is feeling that I was of no use anymore, that uh, I was redundant. You know, this, this guy uh, who's done this, who's done that, and he's got his four kids and he's working along and everything's going right. All of a sudden, it's no use to anybody. He's a village idiot, he's a fool. There's all these things that go in. But the thing is, I, I am used to society. I've got a role to play. I, c I could sit back and I don't have to do this, but I want to do this because I want to change perceptions. I, I, want, I don't want people to experience the same things in life that I've had to go, go for. So if I can give somebody now that leg up and help now, where I, I didn't get that when I was a kid, you know, that, that sort of understanding wasn't around then. So that, that's what I want to do. I, I, I want to change people's perceptions. And, and I can go into schools and I can tell people about my life story. I recently went into a, a school and what I do, I use one of the documentaries, the Swedish documentary that I made, and it's a pretty much a day in the life. And it's a 20 minute section and it shows me from getting up in the morning, putting my leg braces on, uh, shows the scars on my legs, shows me struggling to eat, shows the frustration when I'm in a public place and I can't stop my tics. And it, it covers so many different points that I could never cover. But I found the feedback I've had from teachers is just like, wow, we never knew right. that syndrome right. had that effect on people. And we, I don't want to be seen as weak. I don't want to be seen on the peripherals of society. Uh, and I'm still part of society and, I, and, I, and, and I'll fight for that right. Yeah, it would be nice to see some corporate sponsors stand up and, you know, help fund your work because your work is so important. And it's important certainly in the school system, but it's also important in the workforce because yeah. I would, just based on what you're teaching me now, I would assume that people with Tourette syndrome probably have, are underemployed or unemployed in a much higher um, percentage than other parts of the population, probably other parts of the disability population as well, just based on what you're telling me. And you're telling me things I didn't know. Well, it's amazing because when I said about a diagnosis being a negative label, not a negative label, if we don't get a diagnosis of our conditions, we get branded with negative labels. So when I was at school, I was called good for nothing, daydreamer, inherently evil <laughs> and lazy and this you know i'm thinking i'm a hard worker you know i'm not lazy uh and it's, it doesn't affect your iq neither you know a lot of people with threat syndrome have got a high, a high iq and i found that out when i did the uh, employable me with nancy uh nancy doyle we went through this uh test over a four hour period and i found out that i i've got I'm a visual thinker. I've also got a, a thing for coding, for remembering numbers and sequences. Now, I used to work at a, a paint manufacturer's, and after two or three months of being there, I knew every single code for every single product that they had. I didn't specifically go down to memorize them all, but I no longer needed a, a book, year thick. Uh, I remembered everything, and, and it, I only came to this understanding of it is when Nancy explained I could read a sequence of 13 numbers back, random numbers in reverse. And uh, I didn't know I had that, that, that thing. So another thing that I, I want to do is be able, if we could get something in place, like, you know, we've got SATs in Great Britain where children are tested and that testing just goes to the government and it does nothing, of ben it's no beneficial to the child whatsoever other than put them in a lot of stress. And what I'd like to see in place is something like what Nancy does, and that's like an aptitude test, and find out when our children, our new children with neurological issues, are younger, find out what, what they're going to be able to do in, in the future. I, I do photography, I used to do art, and I've got a very creative mind. And I thought if I'd have had all this information back when I was a child, 
Um, so when you were saying about corporate sponsors and stuff like this, this is this is feeding back into society. It's like helping the farmer who's sowing the seeds, you know, for the for the guy that's going to buy the crop in the end. Because if you can set things straight right back there at school, then you know perceptions are changed right from an early stage. The child's got an understanding, the teacher's got an understanding, every child deserves an education, and it's all moving free flow, but we can dream, and I still dream. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> and it's good that you still dream. It's still good. It's you need to dream. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, I was just going to say. Actually, I you know I've seen Paul's photos. He sometimes posts them on uh, on social media, and they're, they're really very good. Um, so, um, and I, and I think and I, and I think that um, before we close, because I think we're we're quite uh, close to the end of our time. I just wanted to sort of uh, ask one more thing about the the. Not, you've talked about some of the physical um, stress that that controlling uh, your yeah. your ticks puts puts upon you. I mean, how do you how do you deal with that? That you know, how do you keep the energy to keep keep going? Because I mean, just restraining yourself from 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 the ticking is is I I, I appreciate it, tremendously hard. Hard work. So, what do you do to to recharge your batteries? Uh, photography gives me respite. Being creative gives me respite. Dream photography. I dream uh, landscapes. I dream things. Um, I sleep and I, and I physically train. Uh, as you can, you probably be able to see, as people are watching through this video, you might see my neck movements and my neck wants to throw itself back, but I'm holding my neck back. Uh, so. It's like doing a workout, and afterwards you're tired. And I know I know I'll fall asleep after this this interview because it's physically it's always payback time. But I, I allow for that, and it doesn't bother me because I, I know another thing that makes it all worthwhile um, for me is the fact that I know I can change uh, people's perceptions. Uh, can I just say one thing? Right, of usually course. in schools. In workplace, people say the thing is about working with somebody with Tourette's, they're a distraction, they're a disturbance. Now, if we think about every single workplace or school when we're in school, people putting a glass down, <coughs> people coughing, people moving a chair, <coughs> they're all noises, they're all disturbances, but we understand what they are. Right? The chair gets moved. It's not thrown us out of our swing with work because it's somebody moving a chair. Now, what I want people to understand, if they understand Tourette's and they understand the nature of Tourette's, then when this is happening in class and when this is happening uh, in the workplace, it does it stops being a distraction then because people understand what it is. And it's uh, I've read that somewhere, <laughs> and I think it's an absolute brilliant illustration to, to give out to people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, it makes sense. People, if they know what it is, they can start filtering it out, and and yeah. and, and you know, it, then the acceptance comes. Thank you, Paul. It's been it's been a great to chat with you. I'm really looking yeah. forward to um, you joining us on Twitter on on Tuesday. Just need to thank the our supporters, Barclays, Microlink, and and MyClearText because they keep us going. Um, we hope that. We'll get you some support, support through some of the stuff that we're doing because we love what you're doing to keep you going. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity as well, and, and brilliant meeting all of you. Appreciate that. Great thank job. You. Great job. Bravo. Bravo for your work. Bravo. Thank you.